In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, traditionally called Gadate Sunday. Gadate is Latin for rejoice. And you see that the third candle on the Advent wreath has been lit. It's a rose-colored candle signifying joy. This day reminds us that we are about to enter a time of joyful celebration with the birth of Jesus. In past church tradition, the season of Advent had been marked as a time of fasting and penitence in preparation for Christmas, much like the season of Lent in which fasting and acts of penitence are done in preparation for Easter and the resurrection. The third Sunday of Advent was des designated as Gadate Sunday so that people could take a break from the heaviness of penitence and be joyful, be glad at the imminent coming of the Lord. Our readings today invite us into a stance of rejoicing. The Old Testament prophet Zephaniah proclaims, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. Zephaniah was a Hebrew prophet who lived in the 7th century BCE, before Common Era, during the reign of King Josiah, who was likely the last great king of Judah. The people to whom Zephaniah spoke were experiencing profound challenges every day. The world powers of Babylon and Assyria were sitting at their doorstep. Foreign armies were a constant threat. Their supply of food and water was precarious. In the earlier verses of his brief book, Zephaniah warned the people of God's judgment. In our reading today, he looks beyond punishment to the restoration of God's people. He says, the Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. These are powerful words of hope and encouragement, and I imagine they brought joy to God's people. Our reading from Isaiah this morning is a hymn that celebrates God's divine strength. It sings of the expectation of God's salvation. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. These words express joy that is known to the people as well as joy that's anticipated for, for God's people. And then in his letter to Philippians, the Apostle Paul exhorts his friends in Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. In the face of their trials and tribulations, Paul tells the Philippians, rejoice. Live joyfully. The Lord is near. We are given these wonderful words of encouragement from Zephaniah, Isaiah and Paul to rejoice and be glad for God is with God's people. And then we come to our reading from the Gospel of Luke. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able 
from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What's going on? Where's the joy in calling people, you brood of vipers? Or giving them stern warnings of God's wrath to come? Why do we hear these words from John the baptizer, especially on Gadate Sunday? I pondered these verses and wondered, why did I offer to preach today? <laughs> Here's some thoughts that I'd like to share with you. In this gospel reading, Luke unfolds for us the key role that John the prophet and the baptizer played in proclaiming the coming of Jesus. Hearing John's call to repentance, people flocked to him to be baptized in the Jordan River for repentance and for the forgiveness of their sins. They came in droves, but John clearly saw the people's intent to obtain God's forgiveness did not result in true changes in their hearts. John could see there was no change in what people valued or how they treated one another. True repentance requires a change of heart, a turning away from attitudes and actions that diminishes one's relationship with God and with other people. By calling people in the crowd a brood of vipers, I think John likened them to poisonous, deceitful, and hypocritical creatures. His message of imminent judgment was intended to wake them up, to wake the people who are flocking to him. He is challenging the people to go deeper, to a deeper level of self-reflection and repentance than they've ever been before. Now in the crowd are Jews, soldiers, tax collectors, most likely Sadducees, Pharisees, Gentiles, they can't hide behind tradition or national identity or their wealth or their position. John says they are all liable to God's judgment. So the crowd asked John, what then should we do? John tells them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Listen to the examples that he gives. If you have two coats, Share with anyone who has none. Share food with anyone who has no food. Take no more money than what is owed to you. Don't use threats or false accusations to extort money from anyone. In other words, if you have truly sought forgiveness from God and repented, show that you have changed by how you live your life and how you treat others. Respond to your fellow human beings with acts of love, generosity, mercy, and justice. So why was the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin such an integral part of John's message to the crowds? I think it was because God called John to be a prof prophetic voice to God's people. John was, in the words of Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John was that voice pointing people toward God, making them aware of their need to change so that they would be open to receiving Jesus into their midst as the Messiah. John was preparing the way of the Lord by bringing people to the point 
of seeing the salvation of God through Jesus Christ. Our readings make it clear that receiving God's gift of salvation requires that we turn from what separates us from God and from one another. Advent is a time for each of us to reflect on the crowd's question to John. What should we do? I would like to share with you this brief reflection by Howard Thurman. He's a great 20th century theologian and mystic. And he wrote a reflection called, I want to do better, that I want to share with you. He says, the concern which I lay bare before God today is my need to be better. I want to be better than I am in my most ordinary day-to-day -day contacts, with my friends, with my family, with my casual contacts, with my business relations, with my associates in work and in play. I want to be better than I am in the responsibilities that are mine. I am conscious of many petty resentments. I am conscious of increasing hostility toward certain people. I am conscious of the effort to be pleasing for effect, not because it is a genuine feeling on my part. I am conscious of a tendency to shift to others' shoulders burdens that are clearly my own. I want to be better in the quality of my religious experience. I want to develop to develop an honest and clear prayer life. I want to develop a sensitiveness to the will of God in my own life. I want to develop a charitableness toward my fellow human beings that is far greater than even my most exaggerated pretensions. I want to be better than I am. I lay bare this need and this desire before God in the quietness of this moment. We are called to live our lives bearing fruit of integrity, making unselfish choices, doing what is just, caring for what God has made. This is our life's practice this is our life's journey as followers of Christ. Let us bear in mind John the baptizer's rough words as a wake-up call that we can always be better and do better as individuals, as a church, and as a community. When we strive with God's help to live the life we claim to profess, we see with great joy God's salvation as we approach the manger at Christmas. I want to close with a prayer I would like to share with you that is part of my own daily prayer practice. It speaks of one's desire to God for renewal and for joy and is found in Psalm 51, 11 to 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen.